Hi, I'm Ben. And I'm Lucas. And we are two aspiring filmmakers making unnecessary commentary on famous movies. Each week, we will randomly select a film to analyze, discuss, and review. We will select the film at the end of each podcast, so you will have ample time to watch the movie before the next episode. We are slightly qualified film students. Yo, yo, yo. Hello. Welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of Slightly Qualified Film Students. Yes. This week, we are analyzing, discussing, and reviewing Quentin Tarantino's sixth film, Inglorious Bastards. Sixth. Yes. Yeah, sixth. Yep, sixth. Um, this is probably his first good film since the 90s. Uh, I mean, Kill Bill's legendary in its own right kill bill is legendary in my opinion it's yeah. like his i his, mean his comeback he yeah he came off of death proof, death proof with sucks. inglorious bastards have you seen death proof <laughs> yeah it, death proof is so bad it. death proof is really bad like and then there's so many people out there who try and defend it and say it's like super artsy and stuff but even tarantino has said yeah it's and just it's like not even that movie. artsy like if he was gonna go artsy, he could have gone that direction. Like, it's just kind of like no one needed he, to. He said see that, that he basically made that movie just for fun. Yeah. it's just like a B list. It is, and uh, this is like Dude, this is like his. Proof. You know what he did with Death Proof? What What did he do? <laughs> Dude, with Death Proof, he filmed it all on film, as he does with all yeah. of his films. But then what he decided to do is he took all the film and just scratched it up. For, like, the effect. So when you watch the movie, you know, it's all, like, busted, the yeah. film. But then there's also moments in the movie where someone will be in the middle of saying something. And then it will just cut to another shot. Oh, my God. Because he's just scratched out that That's part so, of the film. Like, That's so, like, why? It was just so whack. I mean, I do like his film aesthetic he kind of has with all his films, though. It It's pretty stylized. Like, he's not go- doing anything crazy. Yeah. Like a, I don't know, like a Wes Anderson. Like it's not that stylized, but you know, mm-hmm. he does have his signature look, um, and that is present. The good thing that came out of the good thing that came out of Death Proof, though, is that that was Tarantino meeting Kurt Russell. So that is true. That was something. I guess that is true. Um, you want to read the plot summary for Inglorious Bastards, just in case yes, anyone hasn't seen it or didn't watch it. It is the first year of Germany's occupation of France. Allied officer Lieutenant Aldo Rain, who is played by Brad Pitt, assembles a team of Jewish soldiers to commit violent acts of retribution against the Nazis, including the taking of their scalps. He and his men join forces with Bridget von Hammersmark, uh, a German actress and an undercover agent, to bring down the leaders of the Third Reich. Okay, want to hear a funny prank? I did on a kid a few years back. So, uh, <laughs> we were in social studies, um, and we were just starting our unit on the okay. Holocaust. And this was in, like, grade 8, grade Damn, 9. you learned about the Holocaust in And this eight? kid... Yeah. Progressive. Yeah, sure. Anyway, this, this kid did not know what the Holocaust was. Which I thought was yeah. very weird, because, you know, I was that kid that watched Schindler's List in grade what? six. So. Damn. I did. No, re- you know, for our exhibition in yeah. grade seven, because I did mine on, like, uh, social issues in film. So I, like, did a whole thing That's about Schindler's List. crazy. Good on you for being woke. Anyway, I'm in socials, and this kid has no clue what the Holocaust is. Like, genuinely no clue. So I told him that before we have class tomorrow, go home and watch Inglorious Bastards to get some, you know, get some background knowledge. <laughs> so he, Did he believe you? He went, he went home. Yep. He went home and watched Inglorious Bastards and he comes to school the next day and genuinely believes that that was historically wow. factual. That's funny. And he starts asking our teacher questions about it. He's like... He thinks he knows so much now, right? He thinks he, he's chiming in on these conversations. Oh, he's talking about the movie theater. He's talking about... Uh, uh, my teacher was so confused. That's I was just so laughing sad. My head off I feel the, bad for him, but I mean, honestly, if you make it to grade <laughs> eight and you still don't know the events of World War II, then that's kind of on you. 
That's kind of on you. That was, yeah, that was my fault. But I do really actually <laughs> like the way that this is like a, like an alternate history kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's it's something Tarantino has kind of picked up on since he did Inglourious yeah. Bastards. He likes his revenge, and he likes films. literally just he doing did it with Django and Shane of stuff that's already happened, like in Once yeah. Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, he did with Django, and yeah, recently Once Upon a Time yeah. in Hollywood, where he brutally murdered all the Manson killers. Yeah, um, and uh, there is no shortage of violence in this film. It is at some points honestly hard to watch uh but i do think that inglorious bastards is one of his more realistic films you know it's a bit more rooted in reality that's true but i mean there's a lot of scalping especially with the violence (laughs) yeah yeah sure but like i mean that's something that could happen it's not like django where they have that giant shoot off and people are getting flung out of the window oh yeah like, i'm just saying the it's house not like this is a blood, movie you know? with no violence this one is a bit more like realistic with the violence. that is true and it does match the era uh it feels but, like he didn't just try to make something crazy ha- like this feels like it could have maybe actually happened in the 40s um albeit it's like a crazy plot that one in a million odds at working and it works out their whole plan operation kino to take down hitler but i mean it's theoretically i guess plausible so what were your standout scenes uh since i'm sure you already wrote down the prologue slash opening scene um i'll pick the basement scene or the rendezvous with the actress, the German actress, von Hammersmark. Fantastic. Uh, it's such a funny scene. Like, this scene uses... This scene is like the quintessential Inglorious Bastard scene. Yeah. Such a well-thought-out yep. plan that they've been planning for weeks goes wrong because of, like, something completely out of their control. And it's just crazy. It's like a... It's such a twisty and turny scene. First, um... The two German members of the Bastards and uh, Michael Fassbender, who's this English spy character, and he's also a film critic, go to meet Mm -hmm. up with this German actress in this bar to, uh, you know, gather information on Operation Kino, trying to bring down Hitler. And they think that there's not... And she has huge information. Yeah, she does. She knows that the venue's changed and she's going to tell them Hitler's Hitler's going to be be at the premiere. Um, so they think yeah. it's going to be like this really easy meetup in a pretty much all French bar and they get there and there's like six German soldiers there, um, celebrating this, this guy had a kid back home or whatever. That scene is just like the art of building yeah, tension. Yeah, it really is. And when it pays off, I mean, so you, you is the feel opening scene. rewarded. Although I guess my only issue is it, it's edited so quickly um when they actually do start shooting that it's pretty hard to tell what's going on although i guess that's kind of the point and then eventually you're just left with one person left and you're like oh Mm -hmm. okay i guess that happened yeah that shooting lasts like 10 10 seconds seconds and and like 20 people died (laughs) because because that german soldier who had the kid just out of nowhere pulls out a machine gun and just takes down everyone um all right, what was your uh, standout scene? Was it the prologue? Uh, I'm going to leave the opening scene for when we talk about the beginning of the film. Sure. All so right. I'm going to talk about um, my personal, well, one of my favorite scenes in this film, and that is uh, the beginning of the premiere, slash mm. um, when Christoph Waltz's character is quizzing um, Brad Pitt and Diane Kruger. Uh, on their Italian. <laughs> oh yeah, that's hilarious. I Christoph Waltz is such a legend for that scene. His laugh kills me every time. First of all, this scene is just... It's so well done in the fact that it starts with this beautiful tracking shot, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Where we have... Um, well, actually, I guess it begins with that beautiful shot of Shos- uh, Shoshana um standing yeah. by the window that big circular with window David Bowie her red playing. dress yeah that scene yeah so i guess it starts with her standing at that um the big window in her red dress and then she walks down and the camera kind of goes over the over the roof yep. and it follows her 
and then she goes down that grand stairwell and the camera just continues in this one shot of filming the entire uh, German party as they enter the theater. And then it goes up the stairwell and you see Christoph Waltz standing there. And then it follows him down the stairwell where he first um, uh, says hello to uh, Von Hammersmark and Pitt and yep. the other two bastards. And can um, I just say, I love the choice of using David Bowie for that scene where she's staying at the window. <laughs> I, I'm a huge David Bowie fan, so uh, always gets me fired up when I hear that. And then the scene begins, and, you know, it's a funny scene because we've just had Brad Pitt say that he speaks the most Italian of all of them, and then he comes in with his buongiorno. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but the scene is actually very suspenseful, too, because you know that Walt knows that... Uh, Diane Kruger was in the basement when that shooting happened. Mm -hmm. So she's making up this uh, story about breaking her leg on a mountain climbing trip. Mm -hmm. But you know that he knows. He knows. And that's what makes that scene, even though it's uh, layered with comedy, that makes that scene very, very tense. So I'm choosing that as my standout scene. Um, I guess let's just take a quick break and then we're going to jump into the actual review. All right, time to jump into the actual review part. Yep. Um, We're going to be breaking it down. Uh, There is 12 categories. 12 categories. Yeah, and they're each out of their own percentage. And at the end, we're going to add up all the individual percentages and get the overall and then average them out. And that's the grade for the movie. Yes. So awesome. our first category is story and originality, Which and is that is ten percent. Um, I I actually I really love the story that this film tells, and I also love that it's it's a war movie set in World War Two, but it totally it uses that like I said as a base for the problems, but it's such a unique story. Like this is. You, I've never seen a war movie like this. Well, the title is taken from a 1978 film called The Inglorious Bastards, which is about two Italian soldiers in World War II. That's like the only thing Tarantino got from something else. And actually, the lead actors from that 78 film, The Inglorious Bastards, are in this, uh, playing the German propaganda minister, Dr. Mm. Uh, Goebbels as well as one of the bastards, just kind of like a side character, but it's actually pretty cool. He got like the leads of the film he named it after to be in it. Oh, yeah. Um, And of course, Tarantino makes his cameo too. He's actually the first Nazi getting scalped. Yeah. Yep. So I like that cameo because it doesn't uh, involve him saying any lines. (laughs) (laughs) The man cannot deliver dialogue. (laughs) That's true. I actually thought he's okay as Mr. Brown in Reservoir Dogs, but... It's true. But then but then he did Pulp Fiction. <laughs> yeah, then he did Pulp Fiction. Um, okay. Uh, my score for Story and Originality is an 8 out of 10. Yeah, so... Yeah. This was my third time watching it. I know you've seen it many more times than me, but... Yeah. I remember... The first time I watched Inglorious Bastards, I really had no clue what I was getting into because I got into this phase where I was going to watch every single Tarantino film. So it was just the next one on the list, right? And I had no clue what I was watching. And the first time I watched it, I was just so rivet. It was so riveting. And I was so glued to the screen. And then the second time I watched it, I remember being kind of bored. I'm not sure why. It might have just been the mood I was in that time I watched it, but I wasn't yeah. exactly super excited to watch it again. But when I sat down and watched it this third time, it was like the first time I watched it. I was super entertained. And I don't know. Mm. I don't know what it was the second time I watched it, but it, yeah, it really hit me this time. And I there aren't a lot of flaws in the story. I mean, Tarantino 
is known as a director for taking lots of different uh, influences from other directors and other films and kind of incorporating them in a different way in all of his movies. Um, but I don't think that brings on originality. That's just him taking things and kind of, you know, making them his own, but using them as almost like saying thanks to these directors that have influenced him throughout his career. Totally. Um, for me, the, like, I, Inglourious Bastard is such a cool story. And Tar- when Tarantino first wrote the script, he originally was writing this. It, it had a completely different, he had a completely different idea in mind. I mean, it had the same characters and stuff, but it was going in a total different direction. And when he was halfway through writing it, he realized that it was going to be way too long and it would, it would have been like a mini series. So then he kind of scrapped it. Didn't want to do that again. <laughs> no. And then he scrapped it. He made Kill Bill. He made Death Proof. And then, he, and then he was like, I want to make this movie. So he came back to it. And then he rewrote the whole script to make Inglourious Bastards. Um, and honestly, yeah, I think it's a really good story. Really uh, very original. The only problem I have with it is there are a couple scenes that I feel are unnecessary, as in all of Tarantino's films. I mean, he tends to overwrite sometimes um Mm -hmm. i felt like for me personally the stuff that i felt there was too much of was shoshana and um zoller's kind of relationship especially when they're first meeting it Mm. is a little bit too much for me like you, you know we have that meeting of them when they first meet at the cinema and then but then there's that scene in the coffee house where they sit down and talk and that went on for way too long for me it Bro, that's like one of my favorite movie. scenes in the whole film. <laughs> in the I coffee house or the or yeah the, the, the lunch coffee spot shop. when he's getting like recognized by everyone. Dude, I like the ending, but it takes way too long to get there. Fair enough. There's Bro, so I just much love the whole aesthetic of it with the like the okay, soundtrack. Fair. Fair. I don't know. I don't know. I I just like it a lot. I it's mostly because I just like Shoshana so much as a character. Like I think oh, it's. Yeah. Anytime she's on screen, I'm like, just makes, I don't know why. I just find her scenes way more interesting than Brad Pitt's. See, I'm but, the uh, opposite. We'll get into that in acting, I'm the opposite. I, I love the, I love the bastard stuff. Mm. What's yeah. your score for that? Uh, I give it a 9 out of 10% for story right, and originality. Right. Okay, well, next up is the beginning. Um, in this case, chapter 1, I guess. Yep. which is kind of like a prologue. And uh, if you've seen this film, then you probably know what's about to happen. But uh, the opening scene in this film is one of the best written scenes of all time. Can I just say that this is, in my opinion, the greatest opening scene in film history. I'm yeah, just saying. I was going to say that, but I thought that might have been too bold. But honestly, I can totally agree with that. Of all of the films I have watched, there is not a single film that beats the this opening scene it's so good and it's also it's so one of good. the longest it's one of the longest scenes in the entire film uh i think it's 18 oh, it pages is, long it is. yeah it's 21 minutes so yeah it's but it's just genius it's genius even from the opening shot the opening shot is so great it's like perfect rule of thirds um, you get put in the World War II aesthetic right away with that little cat cottage, um, the the sheets being hung out to dry, and then you got the creative reveal of the SS coming in on their motorcade, with the uh, with the sheets being pulled away. Um, right. Also, the soundtrack in this scene, the score is like this Spanish guitar-y rendition of fur elise Mm -hmm. um right at the start it's so like i don't know how he came up with using that but somehow it totally fits like just me describing it it doesn't sound like it would fit like a dramatic world war ii film but it, it does um yeah so basically colonel landa of the ss played by christopher waltz is like interrogating this french farmer because he believes that they're hiding jews in the house Mm -hmm. um so they they go inside and it's like a cow farm and i really love the creative like transition from french to english 
saying that Christoph Waltz like can barely uh, speak French, so they transition to English, so they don't have to use subtitles that much. It yep. feels natural, you know. It doesn't just feel like they're trying to have an excuse to put the film into English. I mean, the other um, thing there is it shows uh, Christoph Waltz's power because he like continuously says, "Oh, make yourself comfortable. This is your home." But like, it's his, he's the one making all the decisions, and it's it's showing is, his yeah, like hierarchy really in the true. scene by saying, "You know, we're gonna switch to English." But he's he's forming yeah. it as a question, but as if the guy's gonna say no, right? Yeah, I mean, I can't really you know describe every nuance in this scene or else we'd be here forever but just know that this is probably the best written opening scene in film history uh it's amazing i love it five out of five five out of five nice yeah let uh okay you know what this is what i'm gonna say about the opening scene this is such a good scene and it's written as if it could have just been a short film, you know? It's, like, has a perfect arc totally. in just this scene. The thing that's, uh, that the scene... This scene is the art of building tension. And Tarantino knows how to do it so well. The other thing about this scene is that, um... Have you seen The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly? Yes. This is Love that Tarantino's movie. homage to that film. Right. Because if you yeah. look at the opening scene of The Good and the Bad and the Ugly, they're pretty much identical in how they're shot and what happens. Uh, the start of Good and Bad and the Ugly, it's a little house. They're working outside. Uh, the antagonist comes up the hill. He enters the house. They sit down. They drink like they drink some whiskey, I think. And they, they have this, com- this interrogation conversation. And then the scene ends with a shootout. And it's... A very similar scene and Tarantino's taken that and then ran with that idea and it's his little like yeah. um because you know Tarantino loves his spaghetti westerns he always says that that is a lot of his inspiration comes from those films so that's definitely him saying you know giving a uh taking his hat off for for uh that film the good and the bad the ugly Alfred Hitchcock said once he said he said this thing about building tension because Hitchcock is known for, you know, his psychological yeah, thrillers the master. and stuff. Yeah, he said this thing where he said that imagine there's a five minute scene where it is just a group of baseball players sitting and having a conversation. You have a five minute scene of them just talking, chilling, you know, uh, talking to each other, and then out of nowhere, a bomb goes off. Now, you're going to have about 15 to 10 seconds of shock, right? Because the bomb goes off and you're shocked and you're surprised. And maybe that instance, it's scary. But the scene itself before the bomb goes off, you're not going to feel anything. You're just going to feel like you're watching a conversation. So maybe that effect works for more horror films and stuff where they're looking for that jump scare, that shock factor. But if you're looking to build tension, Hitchcock said, okay, take that scene and do it the exact same way, except add in a shot that tells the audience that there is a bomb that is about to go off in five minutes. All of a sudden, that scene becomes so much more tense because you know that there is a bomb that is about to explode, but the people in the scene are unaware. So that's what Tarantino does here. He starts the scene off. The scene is already tense in itself because you know that there's something wrong. Mm. And also there's the added fact fact that you know you're watching a tarantino film so you're expecting something to happen that's true there's like dramatic irony in and of itself (laughs) whenever you watch a tarantino film so the scene is tense but then the scene adds to that suspense when in the middle we go through the floorboards to reveal the family under the uh under the floorboards which is the metaphorical bomb in this scene right so I mean, this this scene is just so well done. And it's rooted in Christoph Waltz's performance because Christoph Waltz gives one of the greatest performances of the of the last of the twenty first century in this film. He won the yeah, Oscar for it. I totally this. agree. It's definitely his career high. I mean the man um, speaks like four different languages in this film. And it's, it's crazy. he actually does. I didn't know that he was born in Austria, but his yeah. first language is actually German. Yeah. So. Um 
Okay, this is what I'm, I'm doing for the opening guy. scene, the beginning. I am going to not give it a 5 out of 5%. I'm going to give it a bonus point and give it a 6 out of 5%. We're allowed to do that? I don't even know if we're allowed to do that, but this scene deserves it. Therefore, I'm Can I do it. that too, then? Sure, why not? 6 out of 5%. 6 out of 5, because it's the best of all time, sure. <laughs> Dude, my Sounds notes legit. my notes for the beginning is literally just bullet point perfection. That's it. <laughs> yeah, it that's what it is. This is it's incredible. Um now let's talk about the ending. Yeah, well, if we're just talking about the last scene, uh, like I I love this ending. It's a good ending, but it's not like I just feel like it could have been done better. Yeah, honestly. I agree. But the, the 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 last scene it's good but it just kind of feels like it's on the weaker side of things in this whole film it's not a great note to end on um but but it, it's it is still the actual ending kind of chapter the way that the film ends not just the last scene is actually really creative and i like it i like the twist that it takes it's it's like the antagonist flips to the hero's side at the very end because he's smart and he knows that they're going to lose. Um, and I also just love the, the kick-ass, like, yeah. her putting herself on the screen and then burning it down. So the, the, act, the ending of this movie is really good. And uh, maybe not the last scene. And it's not quite perfect. But mm-hmm. I'll I'll give it a, I'm giving it a four out of five. Um, it is pretty creative. It's not nec- It's like you expect. You know what's gonna happen. You know that there's gonna be big explosions and death, but you don't really mm-hmm. expect it to happen in the way that it does. And uh, yeah. as per the usual, pretty much everyone dies. So <laughs> <laughs> classic Tarantino ending. Uh, four out of five. Uh, I I honestly think the ending is strong. I the thing that I pinpointed for why this ending has its moments of weakness is I feel that it's kind of rushed. That's what I found. Yeah. Because you know, we have Christoph Waltz who's created this super strong presence throughout the entire film. He's a character to be feared. Um and then kind of it's just the power dynamic shifts so quickly that it feels kind of sudden, you know? Because out of, mm-hmm. I, I get, like, I get why it happens, but I feel like there should have been a bit more ease into that power shift. Because, you know, Brad Pitt just just takes, you know, he takes them as prisoners, he shoots the guy, and, and then all of a sudden it just shifts like that. And Christoph Waltz becomes, like, you know, he starts yelling and screaming and you can tell he's scared. And I, I, I feel like they're just, they could have made that scene, like, two or three minutes longer and just added a bit more... I don't know, just something so that the scene didn't feel as rushed. But yeah. on that note, I really like how this film is ended. Like, it's left kind of ambiguous in the fact that it's it's an end for these characters. It's not the end for them. Like, they're still going to go on living their lives. But it ends just on that note. And I love the final line of the film. You know, Brad Pitt staring into the camera, which is in the perspective of Christoph Waltz's character, and him saying... Uh, I think this might just be my masterpiece, which is, you know, it's at the end of the day, that's Tarantino looking at the audience saying, I think this might just be my masterpiece because Inglourious Bastards yeah. is, is his masterpiece of the film. I mean, aside um, from Pulp Fiction, it is his masterpiece. <laughs> dude, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not a huge fan of Pulp Fiction. Damn. Okay. Well, I mean, I don't. Maybe this is a topic for another day, <laughs> but that's controversial. I like Pulp Fiction, but it's definitely Honestly, not my favorite. Honestly, my favorite Tarantino. Tarantino film is Res Dogs. So I agree. It's Res Dogs, and then Inglorious Bastards. Yeah. That's my. Those are yeah. my favorites. I, okay. Sure. What, um, what are you giving the ending? <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm, <laughs> I'm also giving it a four out of five percent. Yeah. All right. right. So next up, we have screenplay slash dialogue. Uh, do you want to take a crack at this one first? Yeah. So, screenplay and dialogue is amazing. This is such a quotable film. Like, I cannot tell you how many people at my school I hear quoting Inglorious Bastards on the daily. I, yeah, that is super, super true. I mean, there's so many lines in this film that are just 
it's it's so quotable and, and they've also been wanting to touch you for a long time. <laughs> Tarantino writes this film else. the dialogue is what creates the tension at the end of the day also the acting but and but how this film is written and how all the characters are so deceiving of one another is what creates the suspense throughout this entire film and also the other thing that adds to the fact of just the how impressive the dialogue is is that they switch to different languages throughout this entire film i mean it, it's, it's in three it's, four languages yeah that's the thing that i like about this film is that it's rooted in reality that you know if we were in world war ii in germany people would be speaking german right yeah you watch schindler's uh, list they're they're they would i mean there's a lot of holocaust films and stuff that uh, they're speaking english half the time is it's at the end of the day, that wouldn't be happening. They would be speaking German. And, you know, they're in France in this film. They would be speaking French. You know, uh, y- they play with f- French, Italian, German, and English in this film. That's the other thing that's just so impressive in how the dialogue is written. So, yeah, I'm giving screenplay and dialogue an 8 out of 8%. Yeah, I totally agree. It is Tarantino's best screenplay. Masterful dialogue. Uh, honestly, like, I low-key, like, this is the film that I kind of, like, aspire to one day write like this. Like, it's just... All the characters are, like, so believable. And they're all written in a way that you never really, like, really, um, like. Or, uh, you know, think that... None of the characters are, like, morally in the right. You know, you don't really feel that kind of the good guy throughout this whole thing. Like, even though I guess you can say that Brad Pitt's morals are in the right place you don't necessarily like him because you know he's like brutally murdering people and scalping them like there's no clean protagonist good guy and just the way it's written is like everyone like you said is deceiving each other like everyone's a snake even the americans like don't trust the british guy even though they're they're on the same side yeah i think it's his best screenplay one of the best screenplays in a in a while too even though this movie came out in 2009 uh, okay, let's I don't talk even think soundtrack. Won the Oscar that year for best screenplay. I just know Christoph Waltz won. Yeah, um, yeah, eight out of eight. Okay, let's get into soundtrack. All right, I I love the soundtrack. <laughs> it's like a perfect blend between songs and uh, an actual score, like an orchestra. Uh, all the all the score like all the scoring orchestra elements have this like spanishy almost influence on them like there's never a a piece without this like guitar sounding like it's straight out of a western showdown in it as well as just the song choices like like i said i'm a sucker for david bowie so that part gets me fired up every time i see it you just like it's the perfect like badass song for that moment um also the song revolver that they use which is also, uh, it's from a 1970s film too, and Quentin Tarantino reuses it during the scene where Shoshana and Frederick shoot each other was like such a powerful song choice. I love that. My my only problem with the soundtrack, it's a bit bare bones, I guess. A lot of this movie is actually silent. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, not silent, but there's no soundtrack. So I give it a 5 out of 7. Okay. Yeah. Great soundtrack, but at the end of the day, there's not much of it. A lot of the movie is silent. I agree. Um, I think the soundtrack, when it's used, it's used well. But I'm also going to say that I like when films don't overuse music. Because yeah, it's, really, it's really uh, impressive when a film can create uh that feel or emotion that they want the audience to feel without using music because music even though it can be used to be very powerful it's also somewhat a cheat at the end of the day you can film anything and put super sad music and all of a sudden you know you're going to get a different emotional response from that audience Mm -hmm. that being said um yeah, they, they there's a lot of silent scenes in this film, and I don't think that's a bad thing, but by any means. But it also doesn't show the, um, it does also doesn't add any score for me for the soundtrack. 
But yeah. I do think that um, like the opening credits scene is it's just so good, so powerful. I love the opening credits. Yeah. Um, the Great font. <laughs> yeah, and then also them they like that opening sequence. There's very little music except for the very start, and then they they're just talking. But then the music kind of comes in, and then as he's you know as he's leaving pretending that he's going to leave the house and he brings in the soldiers and the music just keeps going up and up and up and then it just surges when um right when he says adios and they let the bullets fly au revoir or adieu or ad- uh, yeah, i yeah bid you adieu um yeah i mean masterful that that was so powerful but yeah i i like that they use silence in this film i think it's very strong oh the other thing is um they they like they kind of use a lot of percussion instruments, you know, like that scene mm. where um, where they're set where they're trying to set up all the bombs in the theater. As everyone's watching the movie, they kind of leave the theater, and they're they're like setting up their bombs, and they gotta go and kill the guards, and mm. they've got like the bells and drums kind of during the whole thing. So even though the scene should be like super tense, it's kind of it's kind of funny and comedic at the same time, which I like. Yeah. It kind of lightens the mood. Um, yeah, I agree. Like the soundtrack totally fits <clears throat> all the moods. It's it's pretty funny. Like it's like so dramatic at some points and so under dramatic at some points mm-hmm. that it, yeah. Like I'm gonna give soundtrack just like you five out of seven percent. All right, look at us twinning along. Um, okay, production design. Uh, yeah, let's hop into this one. Uh. The production design is uh, maybe, I, I can't even say overlooked. The production design is insane. To build an entirely, it's the cinema is so detailed, built all on a set. Like, to, like, if you were watching this for the first time, you might even think they just found some art house cinema, some relic. But they built the whole thing, and it's so classy it, it looks so nice i i absolutely love what they did with it um d- yeah the the production design is incredible in this thing it totally fits the era the scenes that are classy they're classy the scenes that aren't they aren't um you know you have stuff like the the cream scene at this really fancy restaurant and um everyone looks great the costumes are super strong too um particularly Shoshana's uh, kind of that storyline's wardrobe, I guess, with all the German uniforms and her outfits because the bastards are kind of just wearing the same thing the whole time. So I'm giving it a 6 out of 6. Okay, for production design uh, with costumes and set, it it fits perfectly with the, with the city and the time period. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did a really good job really um, encapsulating the entire mood of that uh, that time and period and also I really love their use of color in the sets like uh, their use of red black and white and kind of how they use those colors to depict um, the each character's kind of moral code you know when you're with Hitler everything's just red and black and then when you're with the bastards, it's kind of you're in the more of the gray area. And then when you're with Shosh- Shoshana, it's more red and white. And the thing I thought that was interesting about that is, of course, the Nazi, um, the Nazi flag is red and black. But then if you look at the original um, German flag, it's actually red and white. So they're kind of looking at it as like the Nazis and the Germans, and you're kind of getting this, uh, this kind of subtle uh, look at where everyone is morally uh, in the film through the use of the background colors and stuff and Mm. of course their clothing and stuff Um, especially like a big example for that is during the premiere we see uh, Shoshana's in that like very red dress and Brad Pitt is in all white you know he's in all white so that's that's something that I thought was really cool but yeah the production design is just it's it's awesome. The cinema, uh, as you were saying, they built that, and they have that shot where it goes over the walls and stuff for that long shot that they had to create the cinema um, in that way in order to get that long take. But yeah, there there isn't really anything wrong with the production design or the costume design. 
it, it fits in perfectly with this film, so I'm also going to give it a 6 out of 6%. Okay. Uh, do you want to take a quick break before we talk about location selection? Yeah, let's take a quick break, and then we'll come back with the second half of our review. Okay, and we're back. We're moving on to location selection, which is also out of 6%. It's also just as good as the production design. Uh, They shot this film actually in Germany and France. So, Mm -hmm. you know, the countryside is authentic, I guess. Um, You know, every single location in this film is perfectly selected, honestly. Uh, from the opening scene um, all the way to the fancy restaurants and the fancy cafes that Shoshana is in to the cinema. Well, I guess that that doesn't count because it's a built set. But even all the stuff in the forest, while they could have just gone and gone to some generic place in the forest, I really like that kind of like drainage ditch thing they used for that um, kind of opening bastards in France scene. Uh, yeah, and then they got that little cave for um, Eli Roth to yeah. walk out of with the bat. Yeah, yes. Oh, I love that. It's it's a great location selection. I have no idea how they found something like that, but they did, and it's really good. Um, I'm giving it a 6 out of 6, just like production design. I think these two categories go pretty hand-in-hand, hand, and Tarantino totally nailed it for this film. Yeah, I agree. Large, they they use large landscapes. That is a big thing with mm, this film. They they yes. took really beautiful locations and kind of show off the entire landscape. Um, yeah, I agree. The forest, also just their choice of streets to use. They 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 got some really beautiful streets, and of course, a lot of it is production design, dressing them up so that that it looks like we're uh, back in the forties and stuff. But um, you know, it's just really good choices. Also. Um, a lot of the sequences with Hitler or, you know, that scene with Mike Myers and Michael Fassbender, mm-hmm. they shot those in actual um, old Nazi headquarters. Wow. So, you, so you've so you got these buildings that they took and then kind of made up and decorated so they looked a bit more, um, well, new and they weren't as run down. But y- you still have those huge doors that, you know, they show the, like, how powerful everyone is because they've just got big doors everywhere um but if you look at the actual architecture of those buildings those are actually old nazi headquarters so you really get that feel when you're in those scenes yeah so i'm gonna give it also six of six percent okay cinematography my favorite category Uh, maybe not okay let's get into cinematography yeah um this this film is shot like I, I kind of, I love it and I hate it at the same time. I don't hate it. Um, but there are some problems I have with the cinematography in this film. And it kind of just gets bigger on me every time I watch this. Uh, the opening scene shot really, really well. And all really, um, all, all the indoor scenes are done pretty well. I think that some of the wide shots... In the exterior forested scenes are just pretty basic, you know, standard, not very special, I guess. Um, especially that scene where they're, the first scene you see the bastards in France in the drainage ditch thing. Uh, there's nothing really stand out about that scene. It's just shot pretty mm-hmm. standardly. Um, and while I do really love everything in the cinema and the tracking shots they do there, uh, there's just this angle that Tarantino loves where he slants the people so that they're on this diagonal to you and they're kind of like looking down almost on this on the screen and he does it in pretty much all his films and I just absolutely hate it like <laughs> I, I really hate it every time and he uses it at the most tense moments like when Diane Kruger and knows that Christopher Waltz um in that kind of reveal scene where Tarantino gets his foot fetish moment and the shoe fits. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. They, like, <laughs> sure. the tension builds up, and then they use this slanted angle, so it's almost like both characters are, like, looking down on each other. I, I, mm-hmm. I don't know. Like, I kind of get his vision behind it, but it just pisses me off that he does it. Uh, yeah, okay, fair. Yeah. But aside from that, this it's shot pretty well. I mean, it's not really, to me, as standout as a film like um, Parasite that we reviewed last week. But, Mm -hmm. on the other hand, it's not all bad. Um, It's not all slanted shots. And what they do (laughs) do well, they do very well. So I'm giving it an 8 out of 10. Um, It might have been higher if there were no uh, slant angles. But, unfortunately, Tarantino absolutely loves them and puts them all over the place. So, okay, fair. 8 out of 10. Okay. Um, I honestly don't really care about the slant, slanted shots. I, I personally do not like Dutch angles, but he doesn't do Dutch angles. It's how he positions the characters. So it's a little different. Um, but cinematography-wise, it's great use of landscape, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I as I said that. before. I think the some of the standout shots are obviously the spin around the table and then through the floorboard in the opening scene. Um, and they they take um, these amazing moments, but they're also just, like, very simple, you know? Like, yeah. the conversation in the restaurant, uh, Brad Pitt when they're first scalping, and then the bear Jew kills the Nazi. Um, they, 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 there's nothing great about the cinematography there. I do love the shot where Eli Roth first walks out of the walks out of the cave and the music swells and he like walks out with his bat Mm -hmm. i love that shot but other than that in that scene it's very simplistic um but oh yeah this is the shot that i this is the first time i really noticed it and how smart this was Uh, it's when um shoshana goes to lunch uh with zoller or she's Mm -hmm. forced to go to lunch with zoller and they're sitting there in the tea house and Christoph Waltz comes in for the first time. And that's that's when if you're first watching the film, you realize that she she is the same girl that escaped him in the opening scene. Mm, and I don't what the think camera, so, bro. I think you pick up on that earlier. Dude, that's when I picked up on it the first time. I, I had no clue before that. I might just like not, <laughs> well, not have been paying attention. Maybe I'm forgetting the first time I watched it, but I I kinda thought that you Maybe, maybe maybe you're right. It's been a while since I. I mean, there's hints, but the that's when it tells you because it right. goes, it does the flashback. So it's like that's kind of when it yeah. really tells you. But what the camera does is it stays on her face for like a, a minute. It slowly zooms into her face as you hear uh, Waltz kind of going and introducing himself to everyone. Everyone's introducing themselves to him. It never cuts away from her. It's just this one minute shot slowly zooming in and it's all her like facial reaction yeah and like that cinematography choice is it's it, i thought that was so cool and it really builds like suspense because you have no clue is waltz going to recognize her you know mm-hmm. um as i was saying before use of red and black and white um oh so also their use of shadows and lighting in this film so for the uh, quote-unquote good characters uh, they do a lot of flat lighting. Uh, there's not a lot of shadows on them. And then when you're you're more with the Nazis and stuff, there's a lot of harsher shadows with that more um, mm, film yes. noir look. Um, you get that, uh, of course, the basement scene where everything's kind of fairly light, but then y- you've got um, the Nazi commander in the corner, right, in uh, com- complete shadow. And then he walks out of the shadows. And it as the camera moves with him he's still very like hard to see and that's also just a use of lighting um the contrast between him being in the shadows and michael fassbender being like right underneath a a, a light oh yeah i got that's something and i then kind if, of forgot to touch on is how much practical lighting there is in every single yeah. scene it's like so much when you watch this film over and over again you start to notice that there's like three lamps in the background of every shot <laughs> yeah yeah, I forgot to mention that, but um, yeah, I noticed that too, that there's a lot of like practical lights in the scenes. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the shot of um, Shoshana standing in, at the window in her red dress, and then uh, the tracking shot, as I talked about before, 
yeah. <laughs> the tracking shot um, <laughs> as they go around the theater. But yeah, there are a lot of really great shots in this film that make up for the other scenes that are fairly simplistic. Um, but also the other thing I, I would say about cinematography is that the entire film looks nice, but there's nothing incredible about what they're doing with the camera. They're just taking really beautiful scenery or really beautiful That's, locations yeah. and then just setting up the camera and filming and they're using those locations to be the cinematography and not you know not the other way around which is is fine for some moments but i feel like it's done a little bit too much in this film mm-hmm. um so i'm gonna i agree with you i'm giving it an eight out of ten yeah, percent especially the exterior stuff i found was just more like not very yeah. detail oriented not like it had yeah. to be, but I think they could have boosted their score from us. Uh, you know, some some well respected reviewers if they made some stronger choices. <laughs> uh, but uh, now let's move on to editing. Editing. Uh, yeah. Um. Uh, like once again, same thing with cinematography. I have like a love hate relationship with the editing. Um. There are some noticeable continuity errors after multiple viewings. Um, particularly in the basement scene, I love it, but every time you they cut to shots of um, with the other German people in the background, you know, just like having a drink and playing the game, they're like always in different positions and stuff. Uh, it's decently noticeable if you if you're you know taking a closer look like it's not if you've watched the film seven times <laughs> yeah okay but i mean i t- you totally could have noticed it your first time watching it if you just weren't necessarily staring straight into stiglitz's eyes you can kind of tell Fair enough. um also right. this thing happens constantly where it's almost like tarantino or whoever edited it is not rushing it but almost like they didn't film enough of the character walking so they almost like teleport forwards in time uh, uh there's a lot of actually walking around in the shots in this film and i just feel like sometimes they didn't really pay close enough attention to that because i kind of got that vibe from a lot of stuff those are like my two negative things i guess but um aside from that they use like the pacing and the tension that this that they build using editing is like superb so it kind of overshadows those little errors um yeah all the scenes that build tension is mostly from the editing um they like to hold very long times on each of the characters uh there's not a lot of cutting quickly for a reaction shot you know they'll 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 keep it um they'll keep steady on people for a long time. And I think that actually really helps the the actors um, build the tension in the scene. Um, yeah, the, the color grade is really great. Um, it's pretty warm, um, I think, and it does fit pretty well. So I give it a six out of eight um, for the editing. Okay, yeah, I think that Okay, well, Tarantino is known for kind of not being very good at editing his own work. Because the thing is, he he directs his films, but he also writes all of his films. And there's a saying, um, kill your babies. That's a saying. Um, that is a saying. <laughs> in which, in which we're, we're not talking about actually killing your babies, but it's when you write something and when you direct it, you're so attached to every scene in your film that they become like your metaphorical baby yeah and when you're in the editing process you you gotta sometimes kill your babies of course um tarantino is not very great at this and yeah, a lot no, of the he's times actually terrible you, at it <laughs> yeah you get a lot of uh scenes in his films that are just so pointless and unnecessary for the plot progression but he just keeps it in there because you can he tell it, right? that it's like oh yeah tarantino definitely wanted this to be in there like yeah it's noticeable (laughs) yeah but i think inglorious bastards is one of his most well-edited films because there isn't a lot of scenes in this film that i feel were unnecessary i mean there's a couple but for the most part it's it's fairly smooth um 
I think that there are a couple scenes that go on for too long and kind of slow down the pace a little bit. For example, as I was saying before, the coffee house scene. It's funny, it's somewhat necessary, but it goes on for way too long. Also, uh, when they go for lunch at that fancy restaurant, before Christoph Waltz's character is introduced into that scene, it just it, it goes on for way too long. He should have been introduced a lot quicker. Dude, that seems even, hilarious. Even, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, but it's so... It's it's hilarious, but then it also kind of slows down and gets a little boring. Yeah, okay. Until Fair Waltz enough. comes in. Fair enough. Again, also, the basement bar scene. Until they realize that the Nazi commander is in the shadows over there, it goes on for way too long again. It's 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 just not snappy, you know? It's gotta... Sometimes I felt it just has to pick up the pace a little bit. That being said, there are also some scenes are extremely well edited i also really like their use of parallel editing um especially in that scene um with the scalping and um eli roth coming and beating that guy with the bat it's uh it's cut in between that and the the hitler scene where he's interrogating the only survivor yeah and it's kind of like cutting back to hitler interrogating him and then coming back to the to brad pitt interrogating the same guy and yeah. I thought I, I thought that was really well done. Um, but yeah, I think the ending is really good. Yes, there are some scenes that go on for too long, but for a Tarantino film, this is definitely one of his best edited films besides maybe Reservoir Dogs. So I'm going to give this a 6 out of 8%. All right, well. matching again. Okay. We, yeah, we're, we're pretty close this time. All right, acting. Um, okay, let's get into all it. All right, okay. I might have some controversial opinions here. Um, okay. I absolutely... First off, let's just get the thing that we agree on, is that Christoph, um, Christoph Waltz is a legend, and... Yes, sir, this absolutely is... Absolutely carries this, this is, film. Uh, to be for honest, me, like, this, so, this is the greatest villain performance, besides maybe Heath Ledger as Joker. Yeah, like, this but is they're just, so different. This guy is like almost like a lovable villain. Like, obviously he's a Nazi. I don't... I'm not, like... Dude, saying I, I like hate, his actions like no okay, I don't, I'm not saying like, like I like, like his him, character like is... I like him as a person like I think he's a like a likable guy but I just love <laughs> how funny he is he's so funny like, sure <laughs> but it, he's funny in a creepy way like it's very passive and deceiving yeah. and when he's making jokes you're also terrified that he's just gonna shoot someone yeah but yeah absolutely it's the best performance of the film best performance of his career dude especially the scene that gets me is that when he the the shoe fit scene yeah where he's kind of talking to her and he strangles diane he's being so nice and he's and he like puts on the shoe and he looks at her and just out of nowhere his facial expression just turns from like pure like yeah you know normality to just pure and utter horror as he just like jumps on her and chokes her to death yeah like and that's the thing that christoph waltz does is He's he's saying stuff with his with his dialogue and what he's saying to other people, but his eyes are telling a completely different story, mm-hmm. totally and that's agree. what's super cool about this performance. Yes. Uh, um, also, the other thing I want is uh, Melanie, uh, the actress who plays Shoshana. I think she also gives one of the best performances in this film. Yeah, um, I was gonna mention that I think that the three actors they cast, um, I guess the bilingual ones. Diane Kruger, Christoph Waltz, and Melanie Laurent all give the best performances. Uh, I love. I disagree. I love. I disagree with Diane Kruger. Really, I disagree. Really, (laughs) I do. I think that Diane Kruger is the weak link in this film. Damn. Well, I feel like she's she's a little anywhere close to Melanie Laurent or Christoph Waltz, but um, obviously they had to find someone that spoke German and English and yeah but like i feel as i'm watching her especially in like the bar scene or the scene where brad pitt is kind of like he's like pushing her bullet wound and stuff i feel like she she's kind of over the top she does a lot of eyebrow acting yeah she's Um, she's not believable for me she's the only one that i watched this movie and i was like you're acting i noticed that too but at the same time i think it totally fits her character because she is an actor She's an actress. That's true. And she's supposed to be this, like, glitzy, um, trying to make everyone happy, totally life-of-the-party character. Like, 
Uh, but in that the... makes sense for the scenes where, like, she's with the Germans. But when she's just with Brad Pitt and them and they're interrogating her, she should just be her normal self at that, in right. those scenes. Well, you know? I did think that that scene in particular is, like, one of the weakest scenes in the whole film. Um, but I also really love her performance when she, like, reaches into his coat pocket and realizes that that's the um, her shoe in there. It's like... You don't even have oh, yeah, to sure. see what's in the pocket. It's like everyone knows, mm-hmm. the audience knows, both characters know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that they had good performances. Um, I, My problem with the acting in this film is with the Americans. Uh, BJ Novak and Eli Roth, I guess I'd single out and say I just didn't really like their performances especially bj novak i mean he has a really small role but i just Mm -hmm. i don't know why they cast him it's like tarantino liked the office and decided to like make him an extra or something (laughs) i know when i watch when i watch it i like he he does not fit that character at all and it's totally just a bad choice like it makes no sense to me um eli roth like he does a good job acting for i guess what was written for him but I just find myself, like, not laughing at any of his shticks. You know, his shtick that he's, like, this, you know, he's, like, the bat. Mm-hmm. I just, I don't know. I don't think it's very funny, and I don't think his eccentric, really loud kind of asshole personality is, like, amusing. Like, when he's talking to Michael Fassbender and uh, really anyone in this film, he just kind of... I don't know. I, I mean, don't... Eli Roth isn't... He's not really an actor. He's a director. That's true. Like, uh, as a person. He, he. I don't even know why he's an actor in this I film. I don't know either. This is one of his I only credited like, acting uh, his roles. Performance. And Brad Pitt. Like, uh, I, I don't know. Brad Pitt, he's... I like Brad Pitt performance. It's a good performance, but just as soon as I hear that accent, it just pisses me off. And I, like, can't... I, don't, <laughs> I can't stand listening to it. Um, I just find I like his so, character because it's so it's so stereotypical. It's so in like stereotypical. An army like it's funny. There. But I like that. I think it, it's funny. It's kind of and funny. He's kind of the comedic. He he's is kind the comedic, of the comedic relief. relief. I totally get that. Yeah. But at the same, like, just for me, after watching it like the second time, I totally got over every joke about his character, and I just thought he was annoying at that point. I think Michael Fassbender also gives a really good performance. I liked his... Yeah, he does. He kind of mirrors what Waltz does in, like, the fact that he's also... he In that bar sequence, he's... he's There's so much tension in, like, how he's staring down these these Nazis, and you can just tell how much he hates them. Yeah. And you're, you are terrified that he's just gonna stand up and shoot them. Yeah. And um, he really does also mirror that. Also, the actor who played Stiglitz phenomenal love him uh yeah yeah uh i'm giving the acting an 8 out of 10 honestly it i actually originally had this lower um and i thought it was going to be lower but christoph waltz totally saves it and melanie laurent and bumped it up to an eight uh just stellar performance from christoph waltz that's all i have to say and he did win an oscar so and i think it's totally Mm -hmm. deserved Yep, I think I agree. Christoph Waltz's performance is fantastic. Melanie Laurent. Uh, oh, the thing about Melanie Laurent is she she just shows everything through her eyes, like Christoph Waltz, but in a different way. Like she kind of um, she can show the complete anger and hatred she has towards all of the German soldiers, but she doesn't say that. You know, she's talking to them normally, but you can tell that's from her backstory, but also through her acting, just how much. She hates all of them. Mm -hmm. And I love how she kind of treads the line of saying enough to them in a sarcastic kind of passive way that you, they know that she doesn't like them, but she's not saying enough to like get into trouble, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And then, yeah, I said Michael Fassbender. And for me, the only really weak link in my opinion is Diane Kruger. I, I'm not a fan of her performance overall. Yeah. So I'm going to give acting, uh, overall a nine out of 10%. Yeah. And that's the other thing, though. Um, you do have to remember that they pretty much... I don't want to say they had to cast her, but she does obviously speak German and English, and they needed someone like that. 
Uh, same mm-hmm. with Christoph Waltz. That's probably one of the main reasons he was cast. Um, which yeah, I guess they, we didn't really when touch they were on, casting they, they for cast, like these people who speak so many different languages, and that's kind of mm-hmm. limiting, but it worked out really well. And the delivery, even when it's in another language, is like totally recognizable. Like you can understand the tone. Uh, yeah. When they were casting for um, Christoph Waltz's character. It, it took them months because they could not find someone to play that character. And Tarantino was saying, I don't think we can make this movie if we can't find someone yeah. uh, to play this character. And then the next day, apparently, Waltz came in and he just started doing his scene and he was switching between all of these different languages. And Tarantino was just like, yes, yeah, this is my yes. guy. And he honestly he just looks like a Nazi officer. <laughs> it's like <Yeah>. so believable. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, our next category is inter- We're winding down entertainment value. Um, so this is overall just how enthralled are you by the film, and mm-hmm. uh, as to expected with a Tarantino film, it's this is like an action-packed action movie. It's dramatic. It's a comedy, genre-defying. It's a war movie too. And it's entertaining as hell. It's so entertaining. It's probably why I've watched it like seven or eight times. It's near perfection. If there weren't those slower paced moments, uh, it might be a 10 out of 10, but I'm giving it a 9 out of 10 for entertainment value. This is totally rewatchable as many times as you want, really. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's all I have to say. Okay. Cool. Uh, for entertainment value, I was actually expecting this to be much lower for me because the last time I watched the film, I remember just kind of being bored. But this time watching it, I I don't know, I was super entertained throughout the movie. And yeah, as I was saying before, there are a couple scenes that I find are a little too long and kind of slow down the pace of the film. But they're not that bad. And those scenes, even though they're kind of unnecessary, they still have moments that are kind of funny. So that's why they, they aren't that bad. Um... Also, I mean, the fact that this film is so suspenseful and tense throughout is what also keeps you at the edge of your seat and keeps you um, captivated throughout this, like, two-and-a-half-hour film. Tarantino is... I mean, he's amazing at writing scripts and dialogue that are captivating, even though, you know, most of his films are two-and-a-half to three hours long. He's able to make films still entertaining and still fun. I I mean... As we know, in his, when he writes his scenes, the big thing that he does is he always writes in some sort of conflict, yep. um, no matter how small the conflict is. And I always talk about this when I'm talking about script writing, is um, like if you look at Pulp Fiction, you got that elevator scene between uh, Travolta and Samuel Jackson, um, where nothing is happening. They're just in an elevator, but the conversation they're having still has some sort of conflict, which makes, makes the scene interesting. They're arguing over which place has the better burger, right? Yeah. And just that little argument keeps it interesting. Reservoir Dogs, the opening scene, really nothing happens, but they're arguing over what the, uh, what Like a Virgin by Madonna is actually about. Like there's (laughs) always just some sort of conflict or bickering, right? (laughs) That's so good. (laughs) And that's what Tarantino does best. And that's why he's able to make these two and a half hour, three hour movies and still keep them super entertaining between each scene because there's always just that little bit of conflict. So yeah, I'm the only thing that is the, there's a couple of scenes that kind of slow down the pace, but overall I'm going to give it an eight out of 10% for entertainment value. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. Our final category, overall technical achievement. This mm-hmm. is pretty much all the technical aspects and uh, I guess how revolutionary, in a sense, the film is. Is it pushing new ground? Is it um, just doing uh, previous techniques really well? Uh, and I think technically this movie is... It's, 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 it's good, but at the same time, it's not really doing anything special. Uh you know you're not going to watch this and necessarily be wowed by all this new stuff that Tarantino is innovating and i think that that's kind of you know similar with a lot of his films you know at least technically um he's not really out here to change the game and 
invent his own kind of new blueprint for film. But at the same time, he totally has his own style and he utilizes, you know, editing and cinematography and production design, all that stuff to benefit his style really well. So there's not necessarily anything wrong with this film technically, but at the same time, it's not really as uh, captivating as some other films released as recently as it, um, you know, 2009 onwards. Uh, for the time, like, it's shot well. It's, it's, it's not doing the bare minimum. That's not what I'm trying to say, but it's not exactly going out of its way to wow you with a technical aspect. It's more the writing that's meant to stick with you and the acting. Um, he's just trying yeah, to... Yeah, because at the end of the day, yeah. Tarantino is more of a writer than a director. He's like one of the greatest screenplay writers out there right now, but at the end of the day, that's where his passion lies, I think. Yeah. It's not as much of I agree. behind the camera. He's not this, um, you know, Wes Anderson trying to, you know, create this mm-hmm. whole new way of making a film, making it look... He's he, just <laughs> He just to, likes to have fun. Yeah, exactly. Tarantino. He's just trying to bring his stories to life. But I'm totally yeah. uh I'm giving it a twelve out of fifteen. I think it is really well done, but not necessarily pushing new ground technically. So yeah, twelve out of fifteen. Sure, okay. Yeah, for technical achievement, I, I think that this film is strong in the fact that it's just it's stable the entire film. There isn't anything that's like bad about the technical achievement. There isn't anything that's amazing. But, I mean, there is stuff that's amazing in cinematography. Like, there's some shots that are just really groundbreaking. Like, the the tracking shot or going through floorboards. Stuff like that. But, you know, there isn't a lot of that. For the most part, it's fairly simplistic. But, you know, it stays on a very, like, stable kind of, uh, like, just the timeline as we're watching the entire film. Everything is just, you know, solid. Um... But yeah, I think throughout everything... Oh, you know what? I totally forgot to mention, but I'm going to talk about this right now really quickly. Is This was the first time I noticed this, but I noticed a, like a motif that I totally never noticed before. And it is the most motif of dairy products. Mm. Oh, Bro, yeah. You're right. They He uses dairy products whenever there is like a tense sequence between... Christoph Waltz's character. He drinks milk at the start, you know? There's that scene. And then also the cream on the strudel with the... It's... He he uses dairy as this, like, weird kind of motif for yeah. tension. For... And even he gets Shoshana milk, which totally for yeah. a second has you thinking, oh, God, he knows who she is. He's going to kill her. But then he, like, yeah, doesn't. Exactly. It's just kind of weird that he ordered her milk without asking <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, I yeah, I never even really thought about that. But you're right. You're yeah, that, I totally yeah. But yeah, overall technical achievement. Even though I don't think anything is super groundbreaking, uh, because of the fact that it's just solid throughout, I'm gonna give it a thirteen out of fifteen percent. All right, um, let's take a little break before we tally up our scores and get into the final percentage. Yeah, we're gonna come back with our total percentage and then the wheel, the film wheel. Oh yeah. Okay, we're back. Okay, yeah. welcome back. We are uh, we are gonna tally up our total percent. Well, we already did it, but we're gonna average. Um, yeah, let's get into our total percentages. This is kind of our overall grade for the yes. film. Yes. Uh, you okay, go first. I'll go first. I went first last so <laughs> we had very similar percentages this time. There was no big differences. I've gotta say. Um. Like. Yeah. Well, Last time we were off by six points. I gave Parasite a 90. He gave it yeah. an 84. I think we're going to be much closer this time. Yeah. Much closer, but I think you rated it higher. I think I did. Higher. I think I so did. We'll see. Okay. Right. Well, after telling it all up, my total percentage for Inglorious Bastards is an 88%. Whoa. Ooh, okay. Um, that's good. Better than yeah, Parasite, Parasite for Lucas. Better than Parasite. Uh,. Um, 
All right, well, after tallying everything up for me, I gave it an 87 Wow, we were very <laughs> close. So we are within one point of so each other. So that average out to... Uh, I guess we share really similar thoughts about the whole 87.5%. Uh, That's what we average it. Yeah. Um, I guess, honestly, if you asked me, uh, if I were to do this review before watching it, like, a sixth or seventh time, it probably would have been higher mm-hmm. for me. But... So I guess you can kind of take my rating with a grain of salt because I've almost exhausted my watching of this film. Not that you could really do that, but it's getting a bit old. Um, well, I mean, seventh time watching a film. So, but yeah, 87, 88. Yeah. Okay. 87, 88. Pretty strong. Yeah. Very strong. Um, yeah, I gave Parasite a 90. So, And the average for this is actually higher. Than yeah, because average. I brought it down. Yeah, you brought it down. Because of the ending. Um, okay. Um, and honestly, and honestly, if I'm thinking about it, I do actually think that Parasite is a better film than Inglorious Bastards. Okay. Maybe there's some, like, there's definitely some aspects of Inglorious Bastards that are better, but uh, I do actually think that Parasite is the superior film. So. Not by much. I kind of agree with where my percentages lie. But when we average out, they're very yeah. close. Like, Parasite averaged out with an 87, and close. Inglorious Bastards is averaging out with 87.5. And they are almost... And they're kind of similar in a way. They're like genre-bending, great screenplays. Yeah. Uh, really dark comedies. Um, and Bong Joon-ho, actually, even in his Oscar speech, like shouted out Tarantino for mm-hmm. being... Like somewhat of an inspiration. Yeah. So I guess it makes sense. They're totally homies. <laughs> <laughs> so I I just but, uh, updated the film percentage list that we'll be posting on Instagram, the updated version. Um, so Inglorious Bastards is right now in first place. All right. And you can follow us at S underscore Q underscore F underscore S. Yep. Slightly We got uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, and Instagram account. So go follow us everywhere. Yes. And also uh, go subscribe to our YouTube account. Oh, wow. There's a lot of requested films on here now. Yeah, I put in a bunch. Jeez. So, yeah. So, guys, nice. call... Uh, not Don't call us, but DM us or email us. <laughs> um, <laughs> Why is that your go-to? <laughs> call us. <laughs> DM uh, us, yeah, comment us. on our posts, <laughs> or email us. Um and give us suggestions because right now we have one, two, three. We have three requested films on the wait list that will eventually get put on the wheel as we keep going through. And yeah, if you want a film to be reviewed, are we just doing the wait list in the order? Are we doing the wait list in the order that it's written right now? I I don't know. We can. We don't have to. We can just do that. Yeah, that'll be easier. Unless we want to put requested above, like okay. requested as first place priority. Uh, that's true. We could put requested. Above. Requested will go as yeah. first priority. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. okay. Well, do you want to spin the wheel? Yeah, let's get ready to spin the wheel. Um, okay. Spin that I wheel. I guess we should just do it. 100 oh, films got... on there. Updated last week. Yep. Um, um, so Parasite and Inglorious Bastards are obviously no longer choices. Yeah. So I'm going to do a screen recording, yeah. per usual. Let's pull up QuickTime. Okay. Let's, uh, let's see. Yes, sir. Trusty QuickTime player. I feel like... You can always count on you it. You can always count on it. New screen recording. Yeah. Okay, here we go. All so right. what I'm going to do is right now I got them in alphabetical order. I'm going to press shuffle, which is going to put them all in a random order. And then I'm going to, I'm going to roll this thing. Okay. Nice extra random okay we so totally have no idea here what's we go gonna, i'm gonna gonna happen shuffle boom i yeah. shuffled them okay here we go i'm turning up my volume and we're spinning in three two one Ooh. oh what Drum are we roll. landing on oh whoa <gasps> okay we have landed on Brazil. Ooh, that's so hype. Oh, look at I've never, never seen, seen this, this right? film, so this is going to be exciting. Oh, wow. 
Oh, you are in for an experience. I've only seen it okay. once. Yeah. Um, but it is an absolutely fantastic film. I loved it the first time I watched it. I'll just pull up the plot summary here. All right. Low-level bureaucrat Sam Lowry, played by Jonathan Price, escapes the monotony of his day-to-day life through a recurring daydream of himself as a virtuous hero saving a beautiful damsel, investigating a case that led to the wrongful arrest and eventual death of an innocent man of wanted terrorist Harry Tuttle, played by Robert De Niro. He meets the woman from his daydream, played by Kim Greist, and in trying to help her, gets caught in a web of mistaken identities, mindless bureaucracy, and lies. Directed by Terry Gilliam, screenplay by Terry Gilliam, Charles Mc- McCohen, and Tom Stoppard. Uh, yeah, the cast is, you know, your typical Monty Python cast. You got Michael Palin, uh, Robert De Niro's in this, Jonathan Price is in this as well, and uh, yeah, great film, 1985, uh, I'm super hyped, yeah, I love this Yeah, I'm movie. excited, gonna be first viewing. <laughs> yeah, make sure, there's actually two versions to this film, oh. so there's the version that director Terry Gilliam had planned to release, and what um, oh, I forget the studio. I think it's Paramount. I can look it up. Well, okay, whatever. The studio actually released a totally different version of the film and completely re-edited it and changed the meaning entirely mm. because they thought his version um, wasn't... Like, they thought the audience reception would be too low. They didn't think the audiences would like the way he had it planned. So you got to make sure you actually watch the correct version um, of this film. I guess it's the director's cut because the studio did actually change the way it ends. Um, And there's actually a really cool documentary about um, that called The Battle for Brazil, which kind of like shows what was going on there. So yeah, just make sure you watch the correct version. Okay. Um, and make sure you watch it before next week so you can understand our points yeah. on the film. So every Monday we're coming out with a new episode. So next Monday we'll be coming to you with Brazil. Also, uh, we're going to have a surprise episode coming out sometime later this week. So stay tuned for that. Yes, it's going to be... It's going to be fun. Not in the style we've been doing them so far. No, but it's going to be fun. So uh, yeah, definitely look out, <coughs> look out yeah. for that. And we have added... Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse onto the list. That was that fan, was a fan requested. requested. Thank film. you. Yeah. And then yeah, thanks for requesting. We that. got two other fan requested um coming up on the wait list. So if you have more, we'll put them at the top of the wait list if you got a requested film. So, you know, send us an email, request some yep. films. So, yeah, thank you for listening okay. and we will see you soon. Yep, see you guys soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to Slightly Qualified Film Students. Make sure to tune in next week for a new film discussion and review. Our theme song is Slightly Sexy by Thompson Springs. Make sure to subscribe and leave us a like. Send us feedback and comments as well as your thoughts on the film. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at S underscore Q underscore F underscore S. If you would like to send us a question or a comment for next week's episode, you can email us at sqfilmstudents at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you all next week. Bye.